I don't know. I I don't know about you, but I enjoy Christmas. Uh, I enjoy this this time of year, and uh, we're kind of we're kind of get like getting into revved up into high gear for this. Um, I've been shoveling snow and scraping cars. Uh, I, there are some radio stations that are playing only Christmas music now. The malls are getting b- uh, busier. Uh, parties are happening. People are making plans for the holiday. There's, and there's something kind of wonderful and in, in, in what people who are not even believe, uh, believers but find something kind of magical about Christmas um, it, it, what we hope for and what we aspire to be. And it, it's, I don't know, sometimes it seems like people are a little more friendly than they normally are, a, a little more generous, a little more thoughtful of others. And, and perhaps there's this hope for something more in this world uh, that rings through the songs and the messages of Christmas. Uh, and even in Advent, we're talking about love and hope and peace and joy and all of these things that that we deep down really desire to have. And I think one of the uh, favorite messages that uh, has come through, it, it, it's in songs and it's on Christmas cards and it's in stories, was what the angel said um, when the angel was uh, met with the, with the uh, shepherds out on the fields. And uh, the angels... The angels, uh, I got this the right way, guys. Okay, there. Did I do that? Okay. <laughs> See, they're making me feel like I've, you, oh, you did it, yeah. <laughs> Daniel. Luke 2, verse 14, is that place. And uh, what, what we have in there is this beautiful verse of Scripture. Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Hope for peace in our world. But we live in a world at the same time where... Uh, we, we have struggles and difficulties. <laughs> and uh, so as I said, we live, <laughs> we live in a world uh, of turmoil and war. Turmoil! <laughs> war! Don't make me come up there. <laughs> I will if I have to. Uh, we live, in a, we live in a world where conflict is constant. Listen, this, is, this fascinated me. Over the last 3,400 years, there have been only 268 years where there was no war. 8% of human history that we can go back and, and look at is, is devoid of war. Sadly, in fact, the bloodiest century of all centuries in all human history happened in this last century, just the closed off 18 years ago. It was, it was the worst century for war and hostility. And, and uh, we're talking about this, we're not even talking about some of the ethnic cleansing that's gone on or, or, or the, the groups, problems between groups or clans or even gangs and things like that. And it continues to be a devastating factor in our world. Even as there's something called the Global Peace Index that monitors and calculates the level of peacefulness in all countries. And, and uh, so I was, I was kind of uh, uh, glancing through that to see that it covers 99.7% of the world population, this Global Peace Index. And uh, over the last uh, 10 years, it continues to slip. It's down to... Um, 2.3% more aggression and, and war and a, la- a lack of peace. 
And you'd think for all the education, all the technology we have, all of the things that, that we're becoming a, a gentler, kinder, kinder world has actually not materialized. And our world has grown under the ravages of war. The needless slaughter of people, multiple, multiple millions lost lives. E even going back to the Second World War, 70 to 85 million people died, either directly or indirectly, because of that war. And in my generation, had been calling out against war. We've spoken about peace. Artists and musicians uh, have written songs, and they're calling for peace around the world. It's interesting that uh, those who, who saw what was going on in Vietnam and, and the engagement in Vietnam and, and stop the war, pull our troops back. We don't want this anymore. It's interesting that if you go to our parliament buildings in Ottawa, you have what? Atop a of the center block. You've got the Peace Tower. We're looking for peace. It's interesting that even something like... Uh, a beauty pageant, when they're asked questions, they're asked questions about what does our world need, almost invariably, uh, people will say, world peace, we need peace. In fact, I, there's a kind of a, a funny little clip that I just want to show you of a movie called uh, Miss Congeniality. Uh, and, and Sandra Bullock is an FBI uh, agent, and they're concerned that somebody's going to blow up this pageant, and so she sent in to participate in the pageant, and uh, it went something like this. I would have to say world peace, definitely world peace. That's easy. World peace. World peace. What is the one most important thing our society needs? That would be harsher punishment for parole violators, Stan. And world peace. Uh. I've heard that people even did not move on because they didn't say something that was so wholesome as world peace, world peace. We need world peace. You know, it's interesting. One NBA uh, national f uh, basketball player uh, was so... Uh, profoundly moved and touched by what happened in 9-11 in New York City in the Twin Towers when those two uh, airplanes uh, took down each of those towers with almost 3,000 lives lost in that. And so uh, uh, Ron Artest changed his name to, anybody know? Meta World Peace. World Peace. World peace. Perhaps all of this causes us to search for hope, to search for something more, something better, something kinder, something gentler, a world in which peace would rule. So when the angel declares glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to people on whom his favor rests, we say, yes, yes, bring that kind of peace to our world. And I suppose we might be uh, a little understanding if someone were just a bit cynical about this whole peace thing. Perhaps the words of Greg Lake, uh, formerly from the group Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, who penned uh, a song with the help of John Sinfeld uh, called, I Believe in Father Christmas. But here's how the song starts. They said there'll be snow at Christmas. They said there'd be peace on earth. But instead, it keeps on raining, a veil of tears for the virgin birth. I remember one Christmas warning, a winter's light in a distant choir, and the peal of a bell, and that Christmas tree smell, and their eyes were full of tinsel. They sold me a dream of Christmas. They sold me a silent night. They told me a fairy story till I believed in the Israelite. Peace. Yeah, I don't think so. And there are a lot of people skeptical about that. And while, the, the, uh, uh, the, while, while there's pessimism, 
the, proverb, the prophet tells us that, in fact, there is hope. There is hope. But that hope comes in one who would be called the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. In Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, uh, it looks at the doom and the gloom and what's going on in this existence of God's people, where people knew what it was to have the threat of war, where they knew it was to have violence, uh, while, while they were uh, just caught between major superpowers that would go through their land and take them out. They looked forward to a new era when someone would come and put everything to right, all the wrong that has been done. And that there would be security and peace. And it would be wrapped up in a baby. So that he says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish it. These words ring down through history, bringing hope. That, that The hope, though, will be in the Prince of Peace. It's the one who's, who's coming who will bring that peace to us. Hope in him will be, will come only through that. The Prince of Peace is actually Jesus. He's the child that was, he was the baby that was born, the child that was given. He will, his, his peace will ex exist forever and ever. And there are four areas where we see the peace that Jesus will bring to us will come. Four areas of peace. The first one is this. Jesus will bring peace to the world. Jesus will bring peace to the world. We see nation fighting against nation, moved by greed and a quest for power and gaining control and taking territory and, and, and motivated by greed and ego and vengeance. Most of us have little understanding or idea of what it, it's really like, the horrors of war, the danger, the fear. Hold out in some muddy trench, firing at an enemy, hoping that you won't get killed, but you'll be able to kill someone else. People, mums and dads and brothers and sisters, wives, children, all hoping that someone would come home. And some of them came home okay. Some of them came home wounded and would carry scars for a life. Some would come home in body bags, sadly. Haunted by memories, the horrendous nature of going through war, post-traumatic stress syndrome. It's an awful reality. And, and here's what God spoke into this, these words so powerful from Isaiah chapter 2 in verses 3 and 4. It says this, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and he'll settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Don't you long for that? No more war. He'll, he'll teach us his ways. We'll walk in his ways. There'll be no more war. There'll be no more strife. There'll be no more difficulty. Uh, the weapons will be reassigned and beaten into things that are useful and helpful, not things for killing others. Nation will not take up sword against nation. You'll never be training. You won't need an army anymore. You won't have to train for that when the Prince of Peace comes. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 5 and 6, it says this, Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And all of those 
uh, vestiges of war will be used productively. They'll be wiped out, and in that, they'll provide heat and, uh, and help for people. Oh, that God would do that. Doesn't it make your heart want to cry out, oh, Lord Jesus, come, that let it be done on earth as it is in heaven, that there would be peace on earth. It's a very touching story that comes from World War I. It was about five months into the war uh, when uh, in November, the, on the Western Front, the British were fighting in France against the Germans. It was clear at that point that this would not be a, a short war after months of fighting. Here are men in trenches. Uh, they're struggling. They're, uh, they're fighting. They're exhausted. They didn't want to be there any more than their combatants wanted to be there. And the odd time, they would have a, a short truce, a uh, time to bury their dead. Gifts and supplies would be sent to the soldiers, particularly in December with Christmas coming. They received letters and, and uh, food and ammunition. Come Christmas Eve, something strange happened. Uh, the lights went up on the German side, and they began to sting. Stille Nacht, still heilige Nacht. And it was, it was uh, responded to by the Brits, who began to sing, Silent night, holy night. They finished that chorus, and then the, uh, the Brits uh, sang one of their favorite songs, the first Noel. The other side responded uh, by singing, O Tannenbaum, O Christmas tree. Together they sang, O come, all ye faithful. Some of the soldiers tentatively emerged slightly from the, uh, from the trenches in the area called no man's land between the, the combatants on either side. Slowly, they began to move out. They put down their weapons and they walked out and met each other. It was a touching time. Gifts were exchanged. Pictures of families were shared with one another. Through the night, they went on until they had to head back to their trenches in the midst of this war, in the midst of carnage. Here was the Prince of Peace giving a moment of solace, a taste of heaven on earth. There were problems with their hired up that heard that this kind of thing would happen. They would court-martial any, uh, any uh, officer that would allow that to happen. And again, we cry out, oh, Lord, come, bring peace to this earth. We cry out that prayer. And it's the Prince of Peace who can bring peace in a world that is war-torn. Well, secondly, Jesus will bring peace to relationships. When our first parents decided that they knew better than God, that they could live outside of the bonds, the bounds of God's will, that they could do a better job without God, tragic was the results Deep division in relationships with others. Adam and Eve enjoyed a loving, caring, warm relationship. Intimacy, honesty, transparency, showing love and deference for each other. But with the introduction of sin, uh, it led to selfishness, being protective, secretive, hurtful, struggling for control, blame shifting. And even in the first family, we have a, a brother who murders his sibling. From that time to this, there's been discord in relationships, personal conflict, division, anything but peaceful relationships. They would stand in, the, you, you couldn't stand in the same room with someone else. Hurt, offenses having passed, and uh, relations that are broken, bitterness and a lack of forgiveness. It's interesting that uh, Quite a number of years ago, uh, we went with our family to Holland. And we met a lot of family members, uh, some of who ha whom I had never known and some whom had not been seen for a long time. And I remember one uncle we went to see, and he was gracious and warm and received us. But he'd had a problem with his brother. 
he felt like he was, he was not given a fair share of something that had happened decades earlier. And he would not have anything to do with him. It, 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 was, it was so bad that he made special arrangements that when he would die, something would happen immediately. They would have a small service. He didn't want the possibility that his brother would find out that he had died and be able to come to a service. Those kind of rifts can go deep. It, 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 can, it can pit people against people, broken relationships, and all of us are prone to it. All of us ha have received or been offended uh, by others. All of us have maybe offended others. But the Prince of Peace came to repair and to bring reconciliation. Uh, the problem, there a problem existed between Israel and between the Gentiles, between Jews and Gentiles. Uh, there were strict boundaries. They stayed away from each other. They didn't particularly like each other. In fact, the temple was a place where there was a barricade. So if you were a Gentile that became a worshiper of the Jewish God, there was a, bar there was a barrier. You could go so far uh, in the court of the Gentiles. And then there was the court of the Israelites. And, and this, this kept them from each other, uh, religiously even. Uh, they, and and here's, what, here's what the Apostle Paul would say in Ephesians 2 about what Jesus did. He said this, for he himself, that's Jesus, is our peace, who made the two groups, that's Jews and Gentiles, um, the two groups one, and he destroyed the barrier of the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put together, uh, put uh, to death their hostility. Problems that we have, God brought, through Christ brought peace. He, he brought down that dividing wall so that we could have fellowship and closeness between each other. There are those barriers, and, and, and we all know about problems with relationships with others, barriers uh, that, that once fairy tale uh, marriage becomes a nightmare. The animosity that you have that you can't get along with other people, a friend who lets you down and you don't talk anymore, a boss who didn't give you the promotion that you felt you needed and it drew, drove a wedge between you. Relationships can become toxic. Kids stop talking to their parents. They stop opening up. There's frustration and, and uh, problems in the home. And they can be a source of pain and anguish. And in Colossians 3.15, the Apostle Paul would say this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since you're members of one body. Let him rule by peace in you. He calls us to do that. And we say, well, like, like how do you do that? It's so difficult. You know, the problems we have in relationships uh, seem impossible to overcome. When, when Jesus' peace is ruling in your heart, it'll allow you to move to, toward them. In the next verse, it actually says that let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it settle down in you. Let it, let it shape your life. And the words preceding this are clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and, and bear with each other and forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you and put on love and bind it all together and then let the peace of Christ rule. I don't know what kind of relational problems you have, but whatever you have, don't let that be uh, maintained on your part. Don't let that hold you back from reconciling with someone. Don't be so proud. Don't be so arrogant. Don't be so hard-headed that you can't extend forgiveness because you're only hurting yourself. And when the Prince of Peace invades your life, he will bring you to that point where you can do just that. That's why the Apostle Paul would say in Romans 14, he said, let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Are you doing that? Or when, when I say this, there's a, a problem in a relationship right away. 
you know the person, you know the event, you know what happened, and, and, and you're, just, you're just unwilling to let that go. Let me warn you, if you don't forgive your brother, Jesus says, I won't forgive you either. You've received my grace, now you need to extend that grace to others as well. When the Prince of Peace comes, he can put together relationships. I've seen it so beautifully happen. I saw it happen a number of years ago where there was infidelity in a, in a marriage, and, and it looked like it was all over. But God was able to rescue that marriage in spite of the problems that had gone on previously. The Prince of Peace can bring restoration. Some of you maybe need to make a phone call when you leave church today. Some of you maybe need to go and visit somebody. You need to make right something with somebody. Don't let that uh, don't let stay in that position. Uh, allow the Prince of Peace to grant you what you need uh, to, bring, uh, to bring yourself into a right relationship. Well, thirdly, Jesus will bring peace to a, hum uh, a troubled heart. He'll bring peace to a troubled heart. There are all kinds of things that cause us to lose a sense of tranquility and peacefulness in our life. Uh, losing our job, a, a terrible medical report, uh, children who are going off the rails and, and struggling, the breakup of a relationship. There are all kinds of things that cause us tremors. Uh, and and uh, when Jesus was preparing to leave this world, he knew that what was going to be happening for his own followers was going to be uh, something that, would, uh, that they wouldn't fully understand. He knew that they would be upset and anxious. He knew that it would rob peace from them. And so he's preparing them for his leaving. And in the throes of that, he says to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus spoke in John 14 and verse 27. And he says th these words, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I am with you. I'll take care of you. I'll give you my peace. It's interesting that every time Jesus meets with the disciples and, and, and uh, after his resurrection, he comes and shows up in a room where they're holed up, locked away, and he's in their presence. And, and they're shuddering with fear. And you know what his first words were? Peace be to you. He speaks peace into our life, into the storms. We heard about the storms sung uh, this morning. He provides this solace in the midst of the, so of the storm. Jesus appears, peace be with you, peace be with you. Three times, peace be with you. Uh, there are many things that cause us to shudder, heart beating as if it would jump out of our chest, they can't breathe. The sleep won't come. And he says, listen, my child, trust in me. I am with you. I bring you and I give you my peace. You need to hear from the Prince of Peace. I'm in control. It's okay. You can trust me. The Apostle Paul would say in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and here's what will happen. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He said the remedy for anxiety and fear is the peace of God, but you get the peace of God through prayer. And you'll notice that he uses four different words or expressions for prayer. Uh, prayer, which is a, is a general word, which means uh, like understanding who God is and relating to God in all of his greatness and his power and his wonder and his character. Uh, and then he goes on to say, not only that, but ask. Ask in a way that you expect a response from him. The third one, he says, and give thanks. There's always something to give thanks to God for. His word, his faithfulness, what his, his promises. Give thanks to him and then present your request to God. And if you do that, people of God, if you do that, 
you'll have a peace that is incomprehensible. And it will guard your hearts and your minds. It'll protect your emotions. It'll protect your mind. If you, if you are fixed in him, if you're praying and, and, and settled in him. And I've seen people in the most stressful situations granted the peace of God in an, in an incredible way. There's a young couple that I married. Um, oh, mercy. I'm probably... Uh, probably 30 years ago now, or 20-some years ago. Um, had a beautiful family, of three daughters. Uh, the dad, uh, John, was a, uh, a police trainer for tactical rescue stuff. Trained people in Afghanistan. They, had a God, they have a godly family, three beautiful girls. And it was a couple of years ago, after Christmas, that their daughter and her boyfriend were heading back home uh, from home uh, to go back to school in Ottawa, where she was in uh, med school. Uh, bright, committed, uh, delightful uh, gal. And in their travel, uh, they, lost, they lost control of the vehicle. And they were hit head-on by a, uh, a semi, an 18-wheeler, a, a, tra a transport truck. She was killed instantly uh, a after... Months and months of rehabilitation. Her boyfriend has come back. I, I called this dear couple, and uh, I was just heading out of the country. I was in, uh, unable to be at the funeral. And I will never forget the, the exquisite pain that I heard coming through their voices when you've lost your oldest daughter, who was just such, such a beautiful Christian young lady. And... Uh, and John said to me, he said, Kev, Jesus will be enough. Jesus will be enough. His heart is breaking. His, his daughter's broken body, they'll lay in the ground. But his confidence was, he will be enough. I don't know how we get through. He'll be enough. And I sensed in him the peace of God that surpasses understanding. You can't figure it out. You can't make sense of it. How, how can you be like this? Because I know the Prince of Peace. What, a, what an incredible thing. And I can tell you in times of turmoil and stress in our lives, I can tell you that I have met the Prince of Peace who's brought calm and solace into that situation. In the storms of life, there is peace. Well, there's one last one, and it's this. Jesus will bring peace between us and God. Jesus will bring peace between us and God. If you didn't know it, um, God has a big problem with you. You have a problem with God, and it's this. That because of our sins, we've been alienated from God. Uh, it's put us in a place of hostility with God toward us. It made us enemies of God under his judgment. And the bad news is this. We can do absolutely nothing to fix that situation. There's nothing we can do. We're not on peaceful terms. Uh, there's, there's no armistice. The, the, uh, we're in trouble with God. And yet God was unwilling to leave us in that position. God was unwilling to uh, leave us in that alienated position. And he did something that we couldn't do for ourselves. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, made peace between us and him. Look what it says in Colossians 1. It says this, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That's in Jesus and through him, through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight and without blemish and free from accusation. Isn't that amazing? 
that you were in, in a terrible situation with God. You had ticked him off. You, did, you violated everything he wanted of you. You flaunted it. You did your own thing. You said, I don't need you. I don't want you. I won't follow you. I, and, and that puts you in a terrible position. And you could not recuperate from that. But God, through his love, made peace through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, paid the penalty for our sin, so that we could be reconciled to him. What an incredible thing he did for us. And he put us in a right relationship. And now there is peace between us and God. Listen to what it says in Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, since we have been declared righteous through our believing in what Jesus did, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Peace with God. We stand in that peace. We have access to the Heavenly Father through what Jesus has done. We can burst into his throne room. We can climb into his knee. We can bow before him because there's peace in that relationship. No longer enmity. No longer are we separated. No longer are we alienated. We are his children. He brings us to himself, and we have this right standing before him. No wonder we say glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. They're not empty words. We're saying, when is it going to happen? Well, some of it's happening now, and some of it we'll have to wait until Jesus returns, and he will make all things right for all of us eternity. He is the Prince of Peace, and we celebrate and worship him and thank him, and we live the way he wants to, and we find peace in our life. We find peace with nations. We find peace between people. We, we have peace and tranquility in our heart, and it's all possible because we have peace with God who opened the way for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all that you have done for us. We thank you that these words at, at, at Christmas time are not empty words. We pray and, and ask that you would have your way in our life, that we would know that peace of God that is incomprehensible, that we would know your presence with us, that we would know your care of us, that you would help us in relating to other people in a peaceful way, in, in a congenial way because your spirit works in us. And so we thank you so much for this time of year. Father, guard us and, and guide us to respond as we need to respond, if we need to make a relationship right, if we need to turn in faith to you because we've never, we've never settled that thing with you. We've, we're, we're on the outs with you. Lord, I pray that you'd open the hearts of those who need to open their heart to Jesus and find in him, not, not now an enemy, but a savior. In Christ's name we pray, amen.